what happens with these bills is they usually entangle abortion in there and then they call it, uh, I would say, rights. The Equal Rights Amendment, a new push is on in Washington for gender equality to be recognized in the Constitution. But 50 years after Congress first passed it, the definition of discrimination on the account of sex has changed. We take a deep dive. Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI seeks forgiveness from German sex abuse survivors. We put his comments in context as we look at Cardinal Ratzinger's record. Your life as a vocation. Living through Christ, whether you're married or single. As we approach the Feast of St. Valentine, we explore love, marriage, and those called to devote their single life to God. The mission for the ministry is just to go in and be present with um, the men and women who find themselves um, in jail or prison. Support for believers who are often forgotten, a look at the challenges and rewards of prison ministry. And we go to Jerusalem to witness one man's outreach to Christians, Muslims, and Jews. Just come inside his little shop. EWTN News In Depth starts now. Hello and welcome to EWTN News In Depth. Equal rights for all, regardless of sex. That's the basis for the Equal Rights Amendment, passed by Congress in 1972 as a proposed amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Stalled during the past 50 years, there's a new push to revive the state ratification process. But recent changes in gender and abortion politics have raised the stakes. Mark Irons reports. It's an unsettled issue, enveloped in litigation, sent from Congress to the states, but the response unclear. Over the last 50 years, mounting questions about the status and future of the Equal Rights Amendment, or ERA. Now President Joe Biden with the latest push to add it to the U.S. Constitution. Late last month, President Biden asserting no one should be discriminated against based on their sex, and we as a nation must stand up for full women's equality. In 1972, the Equal Rights Amendment was passed by Congress, supporters hoping it would promote equal pay and end discrimination of women socially, economically, and politically. The ERA states, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. But before the amendment could be enshrined in the Constitution, three-fourths of the states, 38, would have to vote to approve it. Congress gave them seven years to do so from the time the amendment passed in 1972. But by the deadline in 1979, only 35 states had ratified the ERA, falling short of three-fourths. Confusion followed, a deadline extension, concerns about some states retracting their original ratification, and unanswered legal questions about the entire process that continue today. Some have argued the deadlines were unconstitutional. Just two years ago in 2020, Virginia became the 38th state to ratify the ERA, meeting the three-fourths mark, and now a resolution reintroduced in the House of Representatives hopes to pave the final way for the Equal Rights Amendment to be added to the Constitution. But beyond the legal debates about deadlines, there are concerns about what equality actually means for supporters of the ERA. It starts out pretty innocuous, you know, women's rights, like they should get equal pay. But then all of a sudden, the abortion issue always gets thrown in there. Ethel Maharg, executive director of Right to Life Committee of New Mexico, says in her state, equal rights for women includes state funding for abortion. So much more, and it becomes all about her right to kill her child, basically. In a letter to members of Congress last year regarding the ERA, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops wrote, one consequence would be the likely requirement of federal funding for abortions. The bishops also expressed concern with advocates of the Equal Rights Amendment having another agenda beyond protecting the rights of women. ERA supporter U.S. Representative Carolyn Maloney says women and all marginalized genders need equality under the law. And the activist group ERA Coalition shares on its website a focus on gender nonconforming and transgender women and girls and non-binary people. When we look at the ERA, too, we see the issue of sex being completely eliminated, the idea that there is no difference between a man and a woman. Mary Zock is director of the Center for Human Dignity at the Family Research Council. 
She says if the Equal Rights Amendment is implemented, faith-based organizations with deeply held beliefs could face penalties for not complying with transgender ideology. And Zock, a Catholic, describes the transgender movement as one based on a lie. You know, it is not loving to tell a person who is dealing with gender dysphoria that they are in fact trapped inside a body that is wrong for them. That's not loving. That is that is actually the opposite of loving someone that's that's lying to someone. The Equal Rights Amendment evolving over the last 50 years. Mark Irons, EWTN News in depth. And we're joined now by two leading Catholic voices on gender issues, Mary Fiorito of the Ethics and Public Policy Center and Ashley McGuire, Senior Fellow at the Catholic Association. Thanks so much for being here, ladies. Mary, talk to us about the legal side of this. What has happened to the words on account of sex that's so problematic? Well, we all knew what on account of sex meant in 1972 when Congress ratified uh, the Equal Rights Amendment that word has a very, very different meaning now, not only in the law, but also in public discourse. And in the Bostock case, the Supreme Court's case, which was an actual employment discrimination case a couple of years ago, what the court held was that Title VII, which is the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Title VII as it's more commonly known, the word sex now encompasses things like gender identity and sexual orientation. So it's a far vaster category than just male and female. And you know, we, we know this just from, again, the general discourse about how many genders there are. And with some people claiming that you know there's more than 100 different genders. So gender identity, sexual orientation are now considered part of that definition of sex. So the Equal Rights Amendment, just from the, from the get-go, right out of the gate, has a very different meaning legally. That's right. And we're talking about discrimination and employment discrimination in particular, which is a big piece of the ERA. But let's put that legal issue aside. Give us a little background on why this issue is null and void, according to you. Right. Well, the, the Equal Rights Amendment was introduced in 1923 by a pro-life suffragette named Alice Paul. She was the author of the first Equal Rights Amendment. Um, she was so pro-life, in fact, she's quoted as saying, abortion is the ultimate exploitation of women. And the the DRA has has taken various forms over the years as, as it's moved through Congress. Uh, it was ratified uh, by two thirds of the Congress in 1972, and that moved it the issue to the states. And of course, what the Constitution tells us is that to have an amendment to the U.S. Constitution, you need the votes of three quarters of the states, which would be 38 states in in our country. And uh, that there was a deadline imposed on that ratification process uh, from 1972 to 1979, when it, it became clear that ratification wouldn't happen by 1975. The deadline was dubiously um, extended to 1982. But even then, the ERA was not ratified by 38 of the necessary states. So the vast majority of legal scholars, including Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who said two years ago at a talk she gave at Georgia town, if we're going to get the ERA to be an amendment to the United States Constitution, we're going to have to start all over again. So the vast majority of people who, who look at it honestly and um, with the intent that the, the, you know, the legislators had in the 70s and 80s all agree that it's, this is a moot issue. The it, ratification failed. And in order to have an ERA even introduced again, you have to start all over and use the right processes. So an emphasis on process. Ashley, let's talk about feminism. You t you've written about this extensively and the broken promises of feminism. What's pushing this ERA now? Well, you know, feminism is now what I call nothing but a political lie. And I think that's because at a certain point, the women's rights movement got too entangled with abortion. And abortion is a deeply divisive issue. Women themselves are split down the middle on the issue. And ultimately, as Mary said, quoting Alice Paul, it's deeply exploitative to women. But the problem is that if you are somebody who is in favor of promoting the rights of women, you oppose the discrimination of women, um, if you're not a card-carrying member uh, or supporter of the abortion movement, you're out of the game. You're, you're not only are you not relevant, you're a threat. And that's why I think feminism, the promises of feminism are, are broken or, or are certainly on hold. And the problem with the Equal Rights Movement or the Equal Rights Amendment is that now this latest push, it's just a Trojan horse for abortion. And I think that's because the abortion rights movement sees 
um, what's coming potentially down the pike with Dobbs, which would be the overturning of Roe v. Wade, which would just restore the, the question of legislating abortion to the states and, and give the people a voice in the issue, um, and they just can't abide by that. And what um, adopting the Equal Rights Amendment would do would codify Roe v. Wade, and that's why they're pushing this right now. And, however, Ashley, you have written about a true feminist movement, a true push for equality and for a full understanding of the human person and the female. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Well, certainly. I mean, for one, it starts with celebrating women as women and what makes us different. And that requires, I think, celebrating and protecting and respecting the fact that we are the ones with the unique capacity to bear and give life. And I mean, what people are seeing is so insane, this talking about pregnant people, basically um, erasing the, the role of women in, in that unique gift that we have. And, and it's just another way that feminism has basically turned into a threat to women. I mean, uh, it's, it's used to actually discriminate against women, women who are, you know, in the doula practice, who are being forced to adopt language that, you know, not only is not scientific, but basically sort of whitewashes out the actual um, unique biological nature of women. And so I think we have to sort of step back um, and establish a new women's rights movement that, for one, disentangles itself from abortion and two sort of entrenches our our celebration embraces um, what makes us women what makes us different and that's where you're going to see in my opinion real progress when it comes to some of these in my view genuine claims about discrimination against women who are pregnant um, and and the different struggles that women face but that has to start with understanding um, that women are different and, and not being afraid of that. Mary, you talk about the politics of this often. There's a technical issue here around the U.S. archivist, uh, the person that takes the opinion from the Department of Justice and decides whether this is null and void or not. And he's or she will be a new pick by the Biden administration. Tell us about that. Well, you know, in, in, in making this a public issue again, what the Biden administration is doing, even through its archivist, through its Office of Legal Counsel, is it's sort of gaslighting the American public, uh, and I think especially American women. They know what it, that's coming at the midterms is going to be what some political commentators are calling a red tidal wave. Um, there's going to be tremendous backlash against uh, Democratic incumbents, and and you look at the the popularity ratings of this president and his administration. So you know it's the to to put this sort of power into the hands of the archivist. Um, first of all, it's gaslighting because the, the archivist doesn't have the power of Congress. And the archivist's opinion really doesn't have um, very much to say in opposition to a Supreme Court decision that has already indicated that ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment failed. But I think um, the Democrats, whether it's in statewide offices for governor, like in my state in Illinois, or nationwide, um, they, they think that when Dobbs is handed down, that this is going to be an issue with the American people that will drive more people to the Democratic Party. But the exact opposite is true, because what we know from any reputable poll, when you ask American voters, uh, even American women, um, as, as Ashley mentioned, American women are, are deeply divided on abortion, about half and half. Um, they say that they really want to see abortion legal for the first trimester only. And even within that distinction, they make additional distinctions for serious reasons, as they would call them rape or incest, exceptions like that. But they do not want to see a country where abortion is legal for all nine months for virtually any reason. I mean, the United States stands with, I think, seven other countries that have this kind of string, extreme permissive abortion law. Um, the, what, what the Biden administration is doing is simply trying to kind of play a little shell game here. Um, and the, the ERA is the P, and they're just moving it around. They're shuffling it around between their archivist and their office of legal counsel. And then, you know, Jen Psaki saying something about it. But they really have, they don't have the, the authority of Congress. And that's all there is to it. This, this amendment failed. They need to start over again. It was never, it never really captured the hearts of American people, even American women. And, you know, a lot of people, a lot of lawyers would say, this is redundant. After the Civil Rights Act and the Equal Pay Act in 1963, we don't need an Equal Rights Amendment. Um, so we're, you know, there's, we're turning yeah. something that should be about discrimination into something political. Let, let's talk a little bit about, just because we're running out of time, Ashley, the 
church and the way that the church talks to us about women. You came into the church, you're a convert because of Humana Vitae. Tell us what that says and why it matters. Sure, well, I think it's sort of the theological version of what I was saying. Uh, the, the church uniquely celebrates women as women, um, our gifts as women, and I think it's a beautiful thing. I think that the church, um, and I think is increasingly realizing that actually speaking really boldly about sex differences as a beautiful thing, that sexual equal the foundation of sexual equality begins in celebrating what makes men and women different in, with complementarity, that we bring different things to the table, and that that right there is not a threat, but is actually the beginning, the seeds of um, true equality between men and women. And I think that's a beautiful thing, and I hope that the church continues to um, speak that truth boldly because it brings people like me into the church coming from a very sort of, I was in a very secular environment, and that was such a, um, a beautiful and stark contrast to what you see in the culture um, that it, it really draws people in. Well, I'm grateful to you both for this conversation, and we'll be watching this issue very carefully. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Coming up next, news about Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, an expert take on his letter this week expressing regret about sex abuse in the German church. The two become one. And as Jesus said, what God is joined together, let nobody tear apart. Cardinal Dolan explains the sacrament of marriage. We celebrate that love as we take a look at a different path, devotion to God through the vocation of the single life. These all the men were. This is the men? Yeah. So the women and the men? Yeah. And we take you into a colorful shop in Jerusalem, how one man's business has become a place to foster peace. Each individual case of sexual abuse is appalling and irreparable. The victims of sexual abuse have my deepest sympathy, and I feel great sorrow for each individual case. Pope Emeritus Benedict's personal secretary, Georg Gainswein, reads a letter released this week in which the former pontiff seeks forgiveness following release of the Munich sex abuse report. Welcome back to EWTN News In Depth. This report issued last month faulted Benedict for failing to stop priest abuse when he was Archbishop of Munich from 1977 to 1982. While expressing regret about the general abuse situation, Benedict denied any wrongdoing. His letter read in part, Once again, I can only express to all the victims of sexual abuse my profound shame, my deep sorrow, and my heartfelt request for forgiveness. I've had great responsibilities in the Catholic Church. All the greater is my pain for the abuses and the errors that occurred in those different places during the time of my mandate. But there was nuance in Benedict's message, and it was accompanied by a separate three-page rebuttal of the Munich report written by four advisors to Benedict, challenging its findings. Joining us to discuss and to put Pope Benedict's record on church sex abuse in context is EWTN News Executive Editor and DC Bureau Chief Dr. Matthew Bunsen. Matthew, it's great to have you here. Good I know to be with you. you wrote a book about the crisis and about uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict's legacy. Tell us a little bit about that context. Well, that's right. Uh, the, the book came out in 2010 at the time that he was being really savaged by the international press for the, the handling of abuse cases across the whole church. And part of it was an effort to get the authentic record of Pope Benedict. So here we are, an, another decade removed, uh, with new attacks on Pope Emeritus Benedict. Uh, and this letter, I think, uh, sort of nests within that wider context, but he was really trying to accomplish a couple things with this. The first was to recognize the severity of the crisis in the church, just how terrible this has been, and the enormity of the suffering of the victims. At the same time, however, he has an obligation to justice uh, to be clear about what he did and didn't do. But then the, the bigger aspect to it is the spiritual side to this, and that is his reflection of somebody who, as he says, will himself go through soon, we don't know how long, the dark door of death, as he very vividly puts it. Yes. So that's really what is at the heart of this letter, and it's a, it's a profound read. It felt like a blueprint for the response to the sex abuse crisis, this idea of recognizing the horrifying issue, offering an apology, at the same time looking for justice, as you mentioned. In his remarks, though, he used the blueprint of the penitential right. First, 
what is the penitential rite? Well, this is how we all prepare uh, during Mass. Uh, you know, we pray for each other, we, the angels and saints, to pray for us, the Lord our God, uh, that we are sorrowful for our sins. And Benedict uh, also used the image in this of our Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane as the disciples sleep, a, a, a terrifying metaphor for so many in the church, uh, the leaders of the church. And so he takes blame. Uh, as, as he says, that I was once one of the highest leaders of this church. He takes blame for everything that happened. As good leaders do. As good leaders do. Uh, but it, he, he again goes to the spiritual aspect of it, of his own personal awareness of his sinfulness and how we all need to prepare uh, for the inevitable passing from this life and to be able to face it with fear and trembling, as he says, but also with joy and anticipation. Joy and anticipation because we know that our Lord forgives. And so the focus right. on forgiveness was also very interesting and on being repentant, actually acknowledging that to be able to receive that grace. And it's classic uh, Benedict too, in the sense of humility. Mm -hmm. uh, here is one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century, uh, a pope, uh, a cardinal, one of the great leaders in the history of the church. Uh, who speaks from a position of great humility, but also of awareness of his own failings and shortcomings. That's right. So then tell us a little bit more about the context. Um, how did he aggressively deal with the sex abuse crisis in Germany? We can look at it in two phases. The first was when he was the prefect for the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, the Cardinal uh, Joseph Ratzinger, under Pope St. John Paul II. Ratzinger recognized uh, ahead of almost everyone else in the, in the leadership of the church the severity of this problem, mm -hmm. which is why when it exploded in the U.S. starting around 2001, 2002, he helped shepherd this whole process of the USCCB to get the norms of Dallas Charter and all of that approved, and then was aggressive over those subsequent years in having them applied. Once he became pope and was even freer to move against this, the long-standing desire on the part of Pope Benedict to deal with this aggressively was launched almost the, the day of his election. We could see that in how he dealt with the infamous case of Father Maciel mm -hmm. and the Legion of Christ. In Mexico, yes. In Mexico and, and around the world. And we have seen uh, in the years since uh, Benedict being forthright, recognizing the immense failures uh, in the church, but also uh, continuing that record of understanding that we have to deal with this spiritually, but also within the laws of the church and to cooperate with civil authorities and how we can root this out completely. So walking into the discussion of the laws of the church, what about Cardinal Marx and his resignation? Tell us a little bit about how that fits into this picture. I haven't seen it commented on very much. In this particular case, it hasn't. Uh, the abuse crisis in Munich was terrible. This report lays out in, in stark terms just how terrible it was over the decades from the 1940s to 2019. Cardinal Marx himself has been faulted for his handling of cases. He became, in many ways, he has to take responsibility as a shepherd of the Munich Archdiocese of Munich and Freising, mm -hmm. and tried to resign. Pope Francis rejected that right. and said, I'm, you can't walk away from this. He has gotten something of a pass uh, in this latest episode. Partly understandable, though the world's press wants to focus on the Pope Emeritus. And his beautiful letter. But this also, because of the way that uh, Pope Benedict has become the focus, this has made it possible for Cardinal Marx again to reposition himself and to be pushing for the very types of reforms that we're seeing in the synodal path in Germany. Mm -hmm. So in part, uh, part of the, the reason that I think the media has taken this approach is that they're very supportive of this synodal path. So it all comes together in using the sex abuse crisis in Germany as a kind of justification for the pretty radical ideas they're putting forward. But the transparency that we're seeing now is a fruit of what Pope Benedict, Emeritus Benedict, designed, not necessarily a, f a fruit of some of these reforms. So how do you marry those two? Well, you, you marry them in the sense that uh, uh, Pope Benedict, in his time as Pope especially, wanted to have the laws in place that we could deal with it effectively in terms of canon law and our cooperation, again, with civil law. But mm -hmm. he was also sparking and asked for the kind of authentic spiritual reform that we've always had in the history of the Church. He understands that even more profoundly than the canonical side as a theologian. So it is, as uh, Pope St. Gregory the First, the Great, would say, semper ecclesia reformanda, the Church is always reforming, but right. we have to have reforms that are rooted in the clear teachings of the church and the, the, the beautiful teachings from the apostles. Walking into the future rooted in the past. That's right. Um, so one of the beautiful connections that Pope Francis made in reading the letter that Pope uh, Emeritus Benedict put out, he talked about the end of life. Yes. He talked about the heartbreaking uh, push for euthanasia in Europe and around the world. 
what can you tell us about why that was so significant? It was significant because Pope Francis has talked many times about the need to cherish the elderly and not to, he's, he's old himself, as he likes to say. <laughs> he's 85, and, and Pope Benedict will soon be eight, uh, 95. 95. The value of the elderly, not just because of the dignity of the human person, but what they have seen and what they can still contribute. Right. We see that uh, with Benedict in this letter. And Pope Francis wants to make that connection of the value of the human person, the value of human life, and cherishing the generations and learning from them. And he gave us a very specific fact the clear church teaching on why euthanasia is bad, why medically hastened death is bad. That's did right. he use that as an opportunity to come together with some of Pope um, Emeritus Benedict's teachings? He did, uh, and, and we continue to see this uh, very clear consonance uh, of Pope Francis with the, the teachings of Pope Benedict, but also of Pope St. John Paul II on the, mm -hmm. the value of human life. And uh, to go back to one of the things that Pope Francis has stressed really from the beginning, the idea of a throwaway culture. Uh, that when something seems to be no longer of value, uh, we dispose it, we get rid of it, uh, and we try to sanitize our lives, knowing, as we all do, whether we want to admit it or not, that death is coming, that we will die one day. And I think where Benedict's letter is so profound is that this is somebody who openly talks about his death, which is going to be soon, sooner or later, it's going to come. And Benedict is so forthright about it uh, that Francis, I think, was quite touched himself and, and is recommending that everyone read this letter. So teach us how to have a good confession and a happy death. St. Joseph uh, was one of the reflections in, in Francis's uh, meditations in this general audience. So there is the model for a good and holy death. That's right. Thank you so much, Matthew. Great to be with you. There will be more insight into Pope Emeritus Benedict's response to the German sex abuse crisis in an exclusive EWTN interview with Archbishop Georg Gainswein, Benedict's personal secretary. That special report on our program Vaticano this Monday evening at 6.30 and again at 11. It's almost the Feast of St. Valentine. Next, we talk love and marriage, how some are finding love through Catholic dating apps, and how others are actively choosing to serve God through the single life. We'll be right back. Two become one. The Bible tells us that, uses those numbers, two becoming one, when it speaks about marriage. Marriage. A man and a woman become one. They become united in the sight of God and in the sight of society, in the sight of the church. There's a oneness there that cannot be broken. There's a unity there that reminds us of the unity of God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Cardinal Timothy Dolan, Archbishop of New York, shares Catholic teaching on the sacrament of marriage. Marriage is a vocation. It involves a call from God and a response from two people to enter into a sacramental partnership. Couples are called to service to one another. And as Pope Francis writes in Amoris Letizia, marriage is a response to a specific call to experience conjugal love as an imperfect sign of the love between Christ and the Church. But not all Catholics are called to marriage. Some are called to the priesthood, others to religious life, and still others to the single life. It doesn't get as much attention as most other callings. So as we explore this Catholic life, what does a call to the single life look like? We turn to an expert on this topic, our author Luke Burgess, entrepreneur in residence at the Sioka Center for Principled Entrepreneurship at the Catholic University of America. Luke, thank you for being with us. You wrote a book on living vocationally called Unrepeatable. I just finished it, it's fantastic. Tell us about this and how it describes the process of discernment and cultivating a vocation for a person. Hi, Monse, good to be with you. So the title Unrepeatable comes from this fantastic idea that each of us has a unique and unrepeatable way of manifesting God's love in the world. Um, and it's a way that only we can do. It's a way that only we can show to the world. And if we don't do that, it's lost to the world forever. So this is the reality of personal vocation, which is a really key part of church teaching. And it's the idea that each of us has a, a project of our lives that was given to us before God even knitted us together in the womb. So we have it from the very beginning of our life long before we've even discerned our state in life or, or begun to live it out. So personal vocation is this reality of the way that we're uniquely called 
to live out the call to holiness. And the state in life is the way, the, uh, the form that our personal vocation takes in the world. Same with our work. So the, the work becomes one manifestation of our personal vocation, but that personal vocation is the thread that runs through all of them. So I had a good friend of mine who discerned that you know her personal vocation seemed to be manifesting the creativity of, of God and God's creative goodness in the world. And she was doing that long before she got married in high school. She did that in a slightly different way after she was married. And then she's done it a little bit differently in the different jobs that she's had. But that thread of personal vocation has run through her entire life and has given it a unity, a unity of life, which is a beautiful part of what a vocation means. Absolutely. So let's dig into that. For many people, young and old, the call to marriage doesn't come. Some people can feel inadequate or uneasy with that or let down. But you noted that marriage and the family or the priesthood subsist within personal vocation. Give us a little more on that. Right. So personal vocation grounds us in the now. I lived most of my life as a Catholic thinking that vocation was always something that would happen later um, when I discerned my state in life. And it took me quite a while to discern my state in life. And that can be a painful feeling, um, especially for a single Catholic who desires to be married, for instance. But when I understood that I had a personal vocation and I had it at that moment to begin living that day and that there was a continual process of discernment and that the the more faithfully I, I lived out my personal vocation, um, the easier it was going to be for me to understand what God was asking of me. It actually became a key for me to discern my very state in life. So it grounds us in the present, it grounds us in the now, and it's a call to continual discernment and how God is asking us to manifest that personal vocation in the world. And it could happen through various states in life, or we may be called um, to just sit in that place where we're called at that moment. So this is why I think personal vocation is such an important concept for Catholics and, and for renewal in the church, because it grounds us in the present. You know, it's something that I live with personally, and it was a great solace to me to read in your book about this description of subsisting within um, everything else within vocation, because I find it reductive to think about vocation as bound to marriage and family life. Uh, it's so much bigger than that, the way that God sees us. So when you discuss this, this unique role that we have to play, how is that call something that Pope Francis is leaning into for the single people in the church, and why is it so important today? Well, you just have a tremendous contribution to make um, as a single Catholic to the sanctification of, of the world and the people around you in the specific circumstances that you're presently in. Um, so, I mean, obviously you're called to holiness. Um, if you're a single Catholic, you're called to chastity. Um, there are certain things, you're just living as a faithful Catholic that, that, that we're all called to. But then there's a personal and specific way that you're being called to, to manifest that vocation. And, you know, figuring that out is, is what you're called to do and living that out faithfully. And I think creatively is an important part of that. So, you know, if you're a single Catholic, for instance, and you have a desire for family culture and family life, what are the ways in which you can you can contribute to that even as a single Catholic by entering into families and sharing your gifts and talents with them? And also, you know, focusing on on the gifts that you have. Okay, as a single Catholic, it might be more flexibility. It might be more time for prayer. Um, you know, what are the things that have been given to you, the gifts that have been given to you uh, that you can sow into and, and make fruitful? So that, that again comes back to that idea of, of you have a personal vocation and you have it now um, before you may have even fully discerned your state in life or the specific project that you have. So then the last question about this, because I do want everyone to read your book. You talked about a process for discerning this calling, discerning your real vocation. Give us a little bit about that process. Yeah, and the process, you know, should never be done alone. Um, you know, good mentors, holy mentors, uh, whether it's a priest or, or friends and family, people that truly care about you, that can help you discern God's call in your life. So there's a really important social dimension to this. And frankly, it's one of the most important missions of the church. Uh, John Paul II talked about this a lot in his pontificate, that the, the one of the key missions of the church is helping every Catholic discern and live out their personal vocation. And each of us has a responsibility to one another to play a role as a midwife, so to speak, to the personal vocations of other people. And, uh, you know, another simple way, I mean, there's no substitute for prayer. 
uh, as well. So prayer, entering into relationships, and, and developing a, a constant habit of discernment, a constant habit and state of discernment um, unfortunately, I didn't learn how to discern. I'd never even heard the word until I was in my late 20s. And I think in our schools and our families, teaching children skills of discernment will help people be able to identify and live out their personal vocations earlier in life. Absolutely. And not putting the burden only on the single person, but asking families to be generous with what they have so that we can enter into it. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Luke. I really appreciate you being with us to explain this. I hope everyone will read your book. Thank you, Motsi. And for those single Catholics who are still looking for their significant other, a major Catholic holiday for love is just around the corner, St. Valentine's Day. St. Valentine is the patron saint of engaged couples, happy marriages, love, and lovers. For Catholics looking for a spouse, there are dating apps made specifically for them. To name a few, Catholic Match, Catholic Singles, and Ave Maria Singles, they all provide a space for Catholics to meet and potentially discern marriage. We're joined now by Sean O'Hare, the CEO of Ave Maria Singles Dating App, to give us a look at what Catholic dating looks like today. Sean, I just gave you a list of your competition. Why is Ave Maria Singles so different from other dating apps? Yeah, we really think that we're the place where devout Catholics meet. Uh, we really try to put together a, a thorough um, you know, program that allows for those that are, are, are the most interested in finding a, a you know, a traditional marriage and one that's focused on the faith uh, that they're going to find it at, at Ave Maria. And what does devout mean? What do you mean by devout? Yeah, so we want people that are, are practicing their faith and want to seek a marriage that's going to lead, you know, their spouse to heaven. And I think that's um, obviously the, the goal of marriage is to be, uh, to help your spouse, be, to, to be a helpmate for your spouse in getting to heaven. And so um, we want to make sure that those that are participating on our site uh, have that as their as their goal. Absolutely, that's that heavenly goal. But then, what role does this embrace of technology play for those who feel called to marriage? Do you have a lot of people who say, "Walk away from the apps, meet people in person"? What does this mean? How does this work? Yeah, so I think that as Catholics, we're in the business of promoting marriage. Right, marriage is the backbone of culture and society, and uh, the reality is this is where people are meeting. So it's not just that uh, it's important for us to have uh, a Catholic dating uh, op opportunity online, uh, but it's actually mandatory. We have to be in the marketplace. We have to be uh, where people are meeting. It's, it's the number one place that people are meeting these days. And so it's not just an option. It's, it's, um, it's mandatory that we participate um, in the place where people are uh, meeting people and eventually uh, getting married. That's beautiful. It's your Catholic duty to meet people where they are. So then let's talk about your operating environment. What do you think contributes to the plummeting marriage rates? Is the world of apps trying to address that specifically or just bringing the church to encounter people where they are? Yeah, it's a complex situation. Of course, there's multiple factors as to, as to why marriages are declining. Uh, I do think that uh, the, the, the role of the church is paramount. Uh, the the parochial model is one that's always been um, embraced subsidiarity and uh, being present in, in, in the local communities. And, um, and the reality is at some point you have to move into, of course, an in-person uh, engagement. Uh, and so we, wanna, we, we want those that are seeking marriage to have as many opportunities as possible uh, to meet their, their potential spouse. And, and then they'll be the ones that go out into the world and, and become that leaven, right? Uh, but it has to it has to begin somewhere, and they have to meet uh, they have to meet first. And so we're trying to facilitate that. And obviously, Sean, you're out in the world. What is your source of hope for those looking for a Christ-centered love? What advice do you have? Oh well, I think that yeah. First and foremost is that it's got to be centered on prayer, right? Uh, and so um, so we we want to we want to rely on the Holy Spirit to drive these things and and. When it comes to the tools that are out there, make 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 you know, make use of all the tools that are available. Uh, whether it's uh, you know in your local parish, whether it's in community groups and friend groups and workplaces, uh, and and the online um, option is just one more way for people to get there. But um, but yeah, I think uh, we can never lose hope. We're people of hope. Well, one last question for you: What about Valentine's Day? Is it commercial? Is it a uh, Opportunity for spiritual development is it the day you're going to find that special one? Yeah, certainly we've gotten a little a little further away from uh, from the roots of Saint Valentine. Uh, 
I'm not sure any any opportunity to celebrate love is a, is a is a good thing, but hopefully the one rooted in the right kind of love, which is sacrificial, which is self uh, is giving of of of, of oneself to, to another. And so any reason that we can we can find to uh, to promote that is a good thing. Um, and uh, I, I'm I'm pretty sure the uh, uh, wives and girlfriends are never disappointed when there's uh, an opportunity for for a guy to be chivalrous and a gentleman and take somebody out for dinner and, and bring flowers and chocolate. Well, we wish you all the best on your travels and are so glad you were here to chat with us today. Thank you, Sean. Sure. Happy to be here. News headlines are next in the Week in Review. The third meeting of the German Synodal Way takes a sharp, controversial turn. Details of the votes in direct conflict with church teachings. And ministering to those segregated from society, helping prisoners know that God has not forgotten them. Alarming news about inflation tops the week in review. Inflation rose 7.5% last month, the steepest year-over-year -year rise in 40 years, hammering consumers and wiping out pay raises. Grocery prices were among the most volatile, spurred on by increasing costs for eggs, cereal and dairy products. But price tags rose across the board to include apartment rents, furniture, airline fares, used cars and medical expenses. Energy costs also rose sharply. The price of electricity rose more than 4% in January, the highest spike in 15 years. Another shock, this one from Germany, where the German Synodal Way meetings ended last week with controversial calls to change church teaching. We reported last week midway through the three-day Synodal Way meetings in Frankfurt, Germany, and on the final day the votes came in. By an overwhelming majority, a vast coalition of German bishops and laity endorsed a document calling for a change of Catholic teaching on homosexuality. They also voted to approve blessing celebrations for same-sex couples. In addition, the assembly called for changes to the catechism about birth control, writing that spouses should take responsibility for the timing of becoming parents and for the number of children they have. In more revolutionary moves, they also supported the ordination of women and called for clerical celibacy to be optional. There's one more meeting of the German Synodal Assembly in September before the members' reform recommendations are actually sent to the Vatican, in time for the Global Synod on Synodality in Rome next year. Bishops in Europe are pushing back against French President Emmanuel Macron's abortion proposal. Addressing the European Union Parliament, Macron proposed making abortion a fundamental right in Europe and adding it to the EU Rights Charter. In 2021, the EU Parliament passed a resolution declaring safe access to abortion. In a statement, the president of the Commission of the Bishops' Conferences of the European Union wrote, introducing a supposed right to abortion in the Charter would be an unjust law, devoid of an ethical foundation and destined to be a cause of perpetual conflict among the citizens of the EU. An 80-year-old nun and former Catholic school principal in Los Angeles has been sentenced to a year in federal prison. Sister Mary Margaret Kruper admitted to stealing more than $800,000 in school funds over a 10-year period for gambling trips and personal expenses. Kruper, who had taken a vow of poverty, said via teleconference that her actions were in violation of her vows, the commandments, and the law. Prison life is not easy for the devout or those seeking their way towards a life with Christ. But there's outreach to those worshipers who often feel forgotten. Visiting the imprisoned is one of the corporal works of mercy that Jesus Christ himself called his disciples to carry out. From Kansas, reporter Alan Holdren tells us about one prison ministry still doing its best despite COVID lockdowns and difficulty addressing those prisoners in need. Many of the prisons and jails have been open and then closed because of, of the surge of cases, uh, which then of course prevents us from being able to go in. Bishop Carl Kemi leads the Wichita Diocese in the heart of the nation, where he has a heart for prison ministry. Uh, those in, in, in our prisons uh, are among the most marginalized. They're segregated from uh, society. They're often cut off from family and, and friends and, and fellow Christians. So it behooves us, like Jesus, to go to them and to, to support them and, and uh, to, to love them as Christ would, because they, they deserve that as much as anybody. Bishop Kemi was able to make it into a correctional facility to celebrate Christmas Mass this year, an annual tradition that he was forced to forego last year. And I told them, I said, I just, 
I don't want you to feel like the church has forgotten you. And this is my simple way of saying you are remembered and you are loved and you are cared for. And uh, the joy in that room was palpable. Kemi's Diocese of Wichita has a chancery office dedicated to outreach to inmates, the St. Dismas Ministry, named for the so-called good thief crucified with Christ. Since last July, Brant Baca has been in charge of it, coordinating pastoral outreach to the 10 correctional facilities in the diocese in trying circumstances. Whatever they allow us to do is what they allow, and we have to adapt to that, and that's constantly changing, especially since the pandemic. Every once in a while, a facility allows a priest in for mass and confessions, but some haven't allowed a single chaplaincy visit in the COVID-19 era. Eight inmates in RCIA in a facility in Hutchinson almost two years ago are still in a holding pattern, waiting to enter the church until a priest arrives. We do the best we can with writing, writing to them, um, taking materials for them to continue learning about their faith, um, but currently Short of that, there's, there's, there's nothing else we can do until the facility gives us the green light to come in and resume. The St. Dismas Ministry's efforts rely almost completely on volunteers. It's not for everyone, says Baca, but it is for some. They need an authentic person to come in and treat them like a human being. Um, we can provide material things, um, but when it gets down to it, they're longing for something more, and what they're really longing for is that deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. The ministry is definitely a calling. It's not for everybody, um, because it, not everybody's comfortable being in that situation or that environment. Not everybody's cap uh, comfortable being a teacher, um, and, and largely there is a teaching aspect to it of teaching the faith. And for Brant Baca and his 40 volunteers, visiting the imprisoned is a way of life. In Kansas, Alan Holdren for EWTN News In Depth. And a huge thank you to all of you, our viewers. We asked a few weeks ago for your prayers for our friend Randy James. James is battling COVID, was on a ventilator, and in a medically induced coma just last week. We're told he's now sitting up and in rehab, and many are crediting his healing to your prayers. Randy and his wife Evelyn are the founders of the Paul Stephan Foundation, which raises funds and provides support for mothers in need. The foundation is named after their son, whom doctors advised should be aborted due to a medical condition. Paul Stephan graced this earth for 40 minutes before the Lord took him. We're grateful to the witness of Randy James and his wife Evelyn in the pro-life movement. Fabrics of Peace how these beautiful woven threads are providing rare common ground and harmony for people of three religions. EWTN News In-Depth will be right back. It's in the nooks and crannies of life that faith often flourishes. In Jerusalem, down one small alley is a place that embodies an interreligious spirit. Here's reporter Colin Flynn. <laughs> In a country known for deep divisions between people of different religions, in the middle of the old city of Jerusalem, past the churches, the temples and the mosques, down a small alley, there is a place where people of different faiths meet in peace and harmony. Hello. At Bailal Abu Khalaf's shop, he imports his hand-woven silk, cotton and gold-threaded cloth from Africa. So that's real gold we're looking at there, glimmering back at us. Yes. Step inside the small shop, which is packed floor to ceiling with fabrics and pillows, customers are greeted with a freshly brewed cup of coffee. It's Arabic coffee. And it's boiling. Boiling hot. Without sugar. Okay. Over here we have the real traditional of ladies girls dresses. We have some villages near Jerusalem. You know, each village, they have a special type. And then for the men? Men, like what I wear. This is called Qumbaz in Arabic, uh -huh. which is Father Abraham, he was using this. He has become well known across Jerusalem for his beautiful garments, but also for his sense of humor. Big order. No, oh, that's my wife. And the t oh, your wife? <laughs> <laughs> but what makes Bailal's shop really unique is that his fabrics 
are used to make robes for Christian priests, Muslim imams, and Haredi Jews. They come in here and even they make relationship in my store between them when they come to buy. Now this is, you know, material for Catholic priest. This is silk with a brocade, it's called. Of all the materials in his shop, there is one of particular importance. That is the material that was used to make a garment for Pope Benedict XVI. When you saw Pope Benedict wearing your garment, yes. how did that feel? I feel happy. And also the people, when they see him with that vestments, they will enjoy it because it's very special material. That was nine karat gold. Now I want to show you 14 karat gold. 14 karat gold. Yes. Very expensive. We accept the credit card here. <laughs> credit card. You take all major <laughs> credit cards. The loom of that is 10 meters. It takes them 40 days work. 32 needles in the loom. Eight color in the design. 9,000 thread. That's called mosaic design. His grandfather opened this shop in 1936, and his father and uncles later took it over. And as a young man, Abu Khalaf studied political science in Egypt. But during the turbulent early 1980s, he returned to Jerusalem to take up his ailing father's business. In a city that is so divided, Bailal's shop continues to be a rare common ground for the three main religions. He tries to set an example for the future generation and hopes to one day see peace in his country. We teach our children in a clean heart to share all the three religions. We are a human being and we like to live in peace and safe, no problem. In Jerusalem, Colm Flynn, EWTN News in Depth. No problem. Thank you for joining us for EWTN News In Depth. I'm Monse Alvarado. Next week, Colin Flynn will be taking us to the Italian birthplace of St. Valentine. And we'll remember Black History Month as we talk with the leader of the St. Peter Claver Society. I hope to see you then.